Okay, thanks for joining me down here on the floor. I want to continue our discussion of Nietzsche by continuing our discussion of Socrates. Socrates never wrote anything. He didn't believe in writing. He thought that philosophy could only be done through discourse, through talking with one another, through listening, right? Listening was too big of a deal to just, you know, read a book. But Plato thought, well, you know, kind of want other people to know the shit that Socrates said, so maybe I'll, you know, write it down. So that's what he did. He wrote it down, and uh, it's not verbatim, it's not a history, it's a philosophy. But he, so he tells these stories about Socrates, relating the stories that Socrates told. And one of the most foundational texts that we get from Plato is his book called The Republic. And The Republic is a massive book, and it's on, as you would imagine, what is a republic? Book one is mostly about justice, asking what is justice. Actually, many of the books are about justice and what is justice. And what do we need to have a functioning republic, a functioning society where people are free, where people give their voice, where people consent to leadership because of the quality of leadership, not because of force or coercion or enslavement or something like that. So Socrates said that in order to have a functioning republic, education needs to play a big role. Education needs to play a big role because, you know, it's the people who are electing the senators and the representatives and the governors, the people who oversee um, and govern the people, the people who make the laws, the people who enforce the laws. Socrates said, you know, if we're going to have a republic, that means that the people are going to vote for those representatives and those governing officials. And therefore, you know, they need to have a certain amount of education. Like, how are they going to know who the right people to vote for are? How are they going to know whether these people actually mean them well and have their best interests at heart or are, you know, corrupt and scoundrels and people out for their own self-interest? So Socrates said, you know, what we really need to have a functioning, what we need to have a functioning republic is education. And so here in book seven of Plato's Republic, so here's the collected works of Plato, and I'm reading from... Uh, book 7. I'll read the first paragraph of book 7. This is Socrates talking. Socrates is having a conversation with his friend and student Glaucon. Next, said Socrates, compare the effect of education and the lack of it on our nature, on human nature. What effect does our education or the lack of our education, what effect does that have on human nature, how people behave? So he's saying, well, let's compare that relationship, the relationship between education or its lack. Let's give an analogy. Let's give a comparison. Let's give an example. And so he draws a, a hypothetical situation. And he says, you know, let's imagine it something like this, colon. Imagine human beings living in an underground cave dwelling with an entrance a long way up, which is both open to the light and as wide as the cave itself. They've been there since childhood, fixed in the same place with their le necks and legs fettered. They're tied up, able to see only in front of them because of their bonds preventing them from turning their heads and looking around. Light is provided by a fire burning far above and behind them. Also behind them, on higher ground, there's a path stretching between them and the fire. Imagine that along this path, a low wall has been built like the screen in front of puppeteers, above which they show their puppets. Then also imagine that there are people along the wall carrying all kinds of artifacts, that project above it. Statues of people and other animals made out of wood, stone, and every material. As you'd expect, some of the carriers are talking and some are silent. Glaucon's listening to this and he says, it's a strange image you're describing and strange prisoners. <laughs> to which Socrates replies, they're like us. Do you suppose, first of all, that these prisoners see anything of themselves or one another beside the shadows that the fire casts on the wall in front of them. Okay, I could keep going. I would love to keep going. But let's try and get this image in our minds. Let's try and get this image on the chalkboard. Okay, so we've got um, prisoners in a cave. So let's put our prisoners deep down in the cave. So 
down here we've got this prisoner in the cave, right? And he's bound, he's staring at something, he's staring at this sort of screen over here. And it's almost like he's watching a movie. I don't know. Maybe he's, let's say he's watching The Matrix. If you haven't seen The Matrix, highly recommend it. It's basically the allegory of the cave from a Christian Neoplatonist perspective. So anyway, we've got our prisoner down here, and he's bound... Uh, He's bound around the neck, and he's bound around... He can't turn his body, he can't turn his head, right? So there's a line of prisoners, you can't see them because they're all lined up together. So we're only seeing the one on the end in my imaginative drawing. I'm really shitty at drawing. All you can do is sort of watch these images and shadows that are cast upon the wall. And he's down in a deep cave. So I should pause to mention here that there's a lot of hagiography. Hagiography means like stories that are told... Legends. Uh, that are told about great people long after they're dead, where they kind of tell these fantastic stories about um, these these amazing people. And so Plato was obviously one of the greatest philosophers in the history of the world, and he was much celebrated. And there became quite a, a following, a philosophical, theological following that came after him. For example, I think earlier in the course I mentioned Proclus's Elements of Theology, which is you know the, for one of the first theological texts which is written about Socrates, nope, which is written about Plato's writings and things. So Plato himself uh, became quite a figure, like quite a revered figure. And there are some of these stories about Plato being born in a cave. Um, he was uh, born to a, a virgin and born in this sort of, um, you know, fantastical way to this very auspicious special birth where he's born into a cave and then he merges and becomes Plato. But here we just have a cave. So let's, but let's imagine something like the cave in which Socrates was supposedly born according to these hagiographies. There was like a, 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 a cave in the side of a mountain. So let's draw a mountain. Okay, so here's our mountain. Our proportions are kind of off here. Okay, now he says, you know, there's an opening to the cave up above on a path leading down to the cave. Okay, so there's an opening to the cave, which is as big as the cave. I'm, I'm terrible at drawing, so just, you know, try and give the cave a little bit more definition. Maybe it opens up inside. Okay, maybe my OCD is taking over. It's like a combination of ADD, OCD, and just terrible ass drawing. Drawing it over and over again until I get it to the point where I can tolerate it. All right, so here we have this this mountain. I know it's kind of floating in the air, you know, whatever. So we have this mountain going up, and then we have a couple of cave entrances. Let's just say there's an entrance here. Socrates doesn't tell us that there's two entrances to the cave, but this is my cave, so it has two entrances. Now he says that the shadows are cast on the wall by um, by a fire a ways up. Right, so uh, I'm just I'm terrible at spatial things, but the fire should be somewhere up here, right? But I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it up here. So I don't know. We need we need some we need some wood, right? Something to catch on fire. So we add some wood. Well, let's set this wood on fire. Honestly. About the best I can do. So we have this fire burning here, right? Fire burning. You have to imagine it kind of over here, right? So the fire is burning, and then there's people passing in front of the fire, and they're carrying. Well, Socrates uses the word artifacts. What is an artifact? My my daughter's 12, and she actually had the uh, she had artifact as a vocabulary word recently, and um, she actually had all these philosophical words. Uh, as vocabulary, and I sent her back to her teacher with, you know, lots of very complicated uh, philosophical definitions of these words. One of them was artifact. So artifact is artifact is a really important word for Socrates. Artifact is a really important word in philosophy and theology, in fact. An artifact is something that is made or crafted. It's something that is made with your hands. It's like that karavavahe that I talked about in the opening um, lecture that kara something that's made something that's crafted um, and so we have several words first of all there's art right art is something that is 
made by humans. You could say a landscape or like a sunset is beautiful, but it's not art. The painting that a person makes uh, of that sunset would be art, right? Uh, but the art is something, in order for it to be an art, it must be something crafted, something made. Another word in Greek, if you can see it up there. Another word that Socrates uses a lot in, uh, in Greek is techne, which is where we get the word technology. Anything that's, that's yeah, techne is something that's made, it's something that's crafted, something made by humans. So it's important that this fire is human made. It's an artifact. Of course, the people are carrying artifacts, you know, all kinds of shit in front of the fire and the shadows are casting and Socrates calls those artifacts. But it's also important that this fire is an artifact. It's a human made fire. It's fire is one of the things, our human ability to make fire is one of the things that separates us from other kinds of animals. It's also what enables us to destroy the planet uh, so efficiently and effectively and quickly as we are doing. But nevertheless, so this fire is a technique. Now, <clears throat> let's think about if you were to go down into this cave, you know, it's dark down here, and even though there's a fire, it, if you're going from the lights down into the darkness of the cave, you would probably want to carry with you, you know, some kind of a lantern, All right, now here, just for symmetry, I've drawn two lanterns. You know, not my best, not my worst either, though. A couple of lanterns. Now, a lantern, this one I wish I could turn on, but, you know, who the hell keeps D batteries around? You know, we might imagine a lantern not too different than this, but instead of having, like, LED lights in there, you know, it'd have a, a fire, like a real fire. Oh, another fire that's very much like this fire, right, but smaller, still handmade, still an artifact. The lantern is an artifact and the fire inside of it is an artifact. Something human made. All right, now let's fast forward and go through the rest of this quickly so we can get to the madman part, because that's really what we're talking about, right? The madman and the lantern and all this shit. Okay, so we've got this dude down here. We've got a bunch of dudes. They're all tied up. They're bound. They're prisoners in a cave. And all they can see are the shadows on the wall, the shadows that are cast by the artifacts that are also, um, you know, the art, the shadows of the artifacts, which the shadow is cast by another artifact, meaning, you know, the lanterns and the fire and those kind of things. So the fire from the lantern, you know, cast a shadow um, on the other artifacts that are seen. And so the prisoners down here, all they see are the are the shadows, right? They don't even see themselves. They don't see one another. But Socrates says, you know, but yeah, they could talk to each other. So they'd probably be standing there all day, you know, just talking about the shit that they see on the on the wall. They don't even know that they're prisoners, right? Because they've been there since child uh, since childhood. And um, so they think this is reality. They don't know any difference. They just know this is this is what life is from their perspective. Then Socrates says, all right, now. Then Socrates says, all right, now, suppose that one of these dudes, one of these guys down here, somehow got freed. All right, now let's, let's remember the first sentence of this, um, of this allegory. It says, next, I said, compare the effect of education and the lack of it on our nature, right? So then we've got this person here who's clearly not educated. They've been living in a cave their whole life, looking at shadows on the wall. But one of them somehow gets free. Socrates doesn't really tell us how this person gets free, gets loose of their bonds, but somehow they get free. And then they, they begin to, um, maybe because of a desire to know more, to see and understand the reality in which they live, one of them, tries, um, one of them begins to walk out of this cave. Okay, that's absolutely terrible and embarrassing. I'm embarrassed by that. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it's a tiny little person who is arduously making their way out of the cave. Think about how hard it would be, right? They've never stretched their legs. They've never used their arms. They've never climbed anywhere. They've been trapped. You know, there's a lot of atrophy of their muscles and things. Again, if you've seen The Matrix, I think you know what I'm talking about. Right? So because uh, they've been bound in there, they have to... It, Getting out of this cave is hard, it's painful, it's arduous. 
And as Socrates says, so first they see the artifacts and the, the fires that are in the cave, but then they keep going up and out. <clears throat> and finally, when this, when this um, prisoner is freed and then can stand here outside of the cave, then they will see not an artifact, but the sun, right? They can see the sun itself. And Socrates says, well, what do you think would happen to their eyes. All right, let's read a little bit more. Later on in 515D, if you're following along at home. Socrates continues, is, consider then what being released from their bonds and cured of their ignorance would naturally be like if something like this came to pass. When one of them was freed and suddenly compelled to stand up, turn his head, walk, and look up toward the light, he'd be pained and dazzled and unable to see the things whose shadows he'd seen before. He's only been seeing shadows, so his eyes are adjusted to seeing shadows. What do you think he'd say if we told him that what he'd seen before was inconsequential, just shadows on the wall, but now that because he is a bit closer to things that are, what does that mean? He's a bit closer to the things that are and is turned toward the things that are more. He sees more clearly. What does that mean? Things that are and things that are more. Okay, so the shadows on the wall, I mean, they're things, right? They're shadows, but they're shadows of other things. So the things, like the like if I were to have a, a you know, a shadow cast on the wall by, by this bottle. There's shadows on the wall. I don't know if you can see. But, right, the shadow cast on the wall by this bottle is a thing, it's a shadow, but it's fleeting. It's only there as long as the light is there and the object is there. It's not really anything other than just light, right? You can't touch it, you can't feel it, it's just a shadow. But um, but it has some level of reality, right? It's, it has the reality of an image or a shadow. But then the thing, the thing itself, the water bottle in this case, right? it's more real than the shadow of the water bottle. Let me say that again, it's really simple. But it's a little awkward. It's, it's philosophy. So the the water bottle is more real than the shadow of the water bottle cast on the wall, right? So Socrates is saying, as this person who's free um, turns towards the things of which he'd only seen the shadows, then he begins to see, oh, well, this is more real than the shadow. The shadow is there. I can't touch the shadow or anything like. I can't interact with the shadow. But the water bottle, I can. I can pick up it's something. It's more real than the shadows on the wall. And he says, you know, what if he keeps going up all the way out of the cave? What will happen to him as he moves closer towards the things that are more? A little later, Socrates says, and if someone compelled him to look at the light itself, wouldn't his eyes hurt? Wouldn't he turn around and flee towards the things that he'd been able to see, like the shadows? believing that they are really clearer than the ones he's being shown. And if someone dragged him away from there by force up the rough, steep path wouldn't, and didn't let him go until he dragged him into the sunlight, wouldn't he be pained and irritated at being treated that way? And when he came into the light with the sun filling his eyes, wouldn't he be unable to see a single one of the things that now is said to be true? You got the point, part of the point. Right? So then this person whose eyes are, their eyes are hurting because they haven't used them before, to quote the Matrix. Um, but their eyes are hurting because their eyes have adjusted to the darkness, to the shadows, to the images. Um, they don't know what justice is, but they know what the shadows and images of justice are, because that's all that they've known. They've never seen pure justice or had an experience of that before, or true beauty. And now when they get out, their eyes, because their eyes have adjusted to the darkness, because their eyes have adjusted to the darkness, they become blind by the light. They're blinded by the light. Um, and it hurts, right? Just like Neo in The Matrix when he says, Why am I, sir? Morpheus says, You've never used them before. Right. So when you emerge from the cave, that your eyes hurt and thing, it takes a while to adjust. 
says Socrates. But then in time, you know, after some time up here, your eyes will adjust and you'll be able to see things more clearly from the light of the sun, which is not an artifact, right? The really real, the, the, the true source, the one sun, the fall of fire in the sky, which is not an artifact because it's not human made, that in the same way that the fire in the sky is more real than the fire in the cave, which is an artifact of a reflection. And, um, it's an instance. It's a, it's, you know, I mean, it's real. You can burn it. It, it can burn you. It can hurt you. It can, you can use it to cook food and that sort of thing. So it's a real fire, but it's a man-made fire. It's quite different than that, um, than that sun in the sky. Okay. Now there's a lot of philosophy in all of that, a lot of philosophy, a lot of theology too, uh, in this example so far. But now we're only now getting to the point where we can really understand this, um, the symbolism of the madman. And what is, what does Socrates mean by madness in this text? And madness in many of his other texts. Okay, so he says then, all right, suppose this guy, like, he was friends with them down there, right? He was friends with all the other prisoners, all the other slaves that are just sort of held captive down there, being told a lie about the reality of the world. And so, you know, suppose this guy has some sort of developed some sort of ethics or some sort of compassion, some sort of, maybe he cares about those people. Then Socrates says, wouldn't this man, wouldn't this person, want to go back down into the cave, not because he wanted to stay down in the cave anymore, but because he cared about those prisoners, those victims of injustice that are trapped, that are bound by their ignorance and controlled by the people who have created this place, created the fires, created the artifacts, created this manufactured, fake, unreal world in order to keep them oppressed, in order to keep them in bondage, in order to keep them ignorant of the truth, um, so that they can get whatever they want out of them, right? Like in the Matrix, again. So, you know, this dude, this philosopher, this person who's seen the light, who's come out and emerged from the darkness of ignorance and seen the light of the sun, seen the reality, seen what's really real, the truth of what it is. Wouldn't this person, Socrates says, wouldn't this person want to go back down in and, and you know, rescue those others, liberate those who are oppressed down in the cave? And so Socrates certainly thinks that he would. So then this dude, you know, comes back down, back down into the cave. And as he's going into the cave, of course, he needs a lantern, right? Even though it's, so he lights the lantern in the morning hour so that he can go back down into the cave. So it's, it's, it's becoming a metaphor here, I think, if it wasn't already. But so then he needs this lantern, this artifact, so he can, you know, leave the light of reality and go into the darkness, into the prison, into the cave where the prisoners are held, so that he can liberate them and help to tell them the truth, liberate them through education. Right? They have the lack of education, and now that he has this education, he wants to go down in to to educate them about the reality of this prison that they're living in. But as he goes down in, he becomes blinded again, in the same way that he was blinded when he emerged from the cave, because his eyes had to adjust to the light. Now his eyes have to adjust once again, this time to the darkness, right? The darkness to which he came and the darkness to which he returns in order to liberate his friends. So he carries a lantern with him down there. And as he goes deeper and deeper into the cave, gradually his eyes begin to adjust again and helped aided by the lantern and the memories of what he's seen before. And he comes down to those. And then let's have a look at the text. What does Socrates say? Well, here's where Socrates answers his question about education and sort of unpacks the allegory a bit for us. In paragraph 518, he says, education isn't what some people could declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into souls that lack it, right? What uh, this other philosopher, Paolo Freire, called the banking system of education, like teachers just making little deposit deposits of information into you know, empty vessels, just students sitting there mindlessly taking it all in. Socrates says, no, that's bullshit. It's not like, it's not like putting information into the minds of other people. It's not like putting sight into the mind any more than, 
you know, showing these people the light would be, it's not like putting sight into their eyes. Their eyes already have sight. Their eyes already can see, but their eyes have adjusted to the darkness, to the shadows, to the world of prison world in which that they've been born. So what is education like then, if it's not like that? He says, well, in our, our present discussion, on the other hand, shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye, right, an eye that cannot be turned around from the darkness to the light without turning the whole body, right? So this person needs to turn away from the darkness, away from the shadows. They need to turn away from that ignorance. And then, only then can they begin this arduous, difficult, painful journey to the surface. So Socrates says in paragraph D, education takes for granted that sight is there, but that it isn't turned the right way. It's not looking where it ought to be. It's looking the wrong way. Right? You have to change your perspective and try and see things from a different way. Because here, the prisoner is seeing, right? So he's like, well, I see the shadows with my eyes. No one can deny that the shadows are what I see because I see them with my own two eyes. And Socrates is saying, well, yeah. But the problem is you're looking the wrong way, right? You're missing all this other shit called reality, right? And so, but then, okay, so in paragraph 517, Socrates says, you know, what if this person, what if this prisoner goes back down into the cave and sits back in his seat, sits back, goes back to where he was before, and then begins to try and compete, you know, continue what he was doing before. Says, uh, Socrates says, you know, he wouldn't be as good at it as the other prisoners anymore, right? Because his eyes are still adjusting, and he's seen, he's seen too much to be able to see the shadows in the way that they, that they see them. So he wouldn't compete well with the other ones. And then when he tries to explain to them, hey, y'all, you know, you're, you need to you need to get out of this cave where you're living in bondage. You're living in um, your prisoners in a cave. Then Socrates said, you know, wouldn't they think this man was crazy? Not only that he was crazy, but also, you know, he's he's not good at, at seeing the images on the wall anymore. He got out of here and he came back and and it really fucked him up. Right. He can't he can't see the shadows as clearly as we can anymore. He's talking all kinds of nonsense about us being prisoners and like, you know, trapped in this uh, state of ignorance. And Socrates says, you know, if they could get loose, if they could get a hold of him, don't you think they would try to kill him? Because they would just think he is mad, right? He would seem crazy. He would seem like a fool. He would seem like a mad person, like a crazy person. He would seem insane. He would seem out of his mind, right? Because he's all he's trying to do is tell them the truth. But the truth is just something that they can't even relate to or understand. It's beyond their capacity. I have come too early, he said. My time is not yet. And so they would be so blinded by their situation and blinded by their ignorance that they would feel a certain hostility towards those who are even trying to help them, trying to educate them, trying to liberate them from the bondage of their own ignorance, from the bondage of just the, the sheer lack of knowledge that they possess. Okay. One more thing about this, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. So paragraph 518 again, Socrates says, Anyone with understanding would remember that the eyes may be confused in two ways and from two causes. Namely, when they've come from the light into the darkness and when they've come from the darkness into the light. Right. So as you're making this arduous trek up, there's somewhere in between, in between ignorance and wisdom, in between. Right. That's where philosophy happens. Philosophy happens in this discourse in between. We aren't you can't just go from absolute ignorance to the light of philosophy. Right. But there's this philosophy is this difficult, arduous struggle of learning. Right. And so when you're in discourse with other people, you don't know if they're. When they say things that are just like crazy shit, right? People like me who just kind of say all kinds of off the wall stuff. And you're like, 
the hell are they talking about? And so you're confused. They seem mad. They seem crazy, right? And they seem crazy. But Socrates says, well, they, they might be crazy, right? They might be crazy because they're coming out of the darkness and they still don't understand reality. So they're just, they're mad, right? They're out of their mind. But he said, but they might also be mad or appear mad because we're the fools, not them, right? They may appear mad because they're coming from the light into the darkness as this person who's coming down to try and liberate or educate those who are trapped in the cave and to lead them out of the cave. But Socrates says, you know, the madness seems the same no matter what. So how do you know if this person who's saying mad shit to you, just crazy shit to you, how do you know if they're just crazy or mad or ignorant or uneducated or if they're the wise coming into the darkness? The answer is, you don't. You don't. You don't. But because you don't, it's therefore all the more important to listen to these madmen, right? You may be the madman and the one madman in the midst of all these ignorant fools. Uh, you may be the madman on the hill, the fool on the hill, surrounded by other fools who think you're the fool, when in fact you're not the fool, because you're the fool who they're calling the fool, but even though you're not the fool, you're the fool that recognizes that they're the fools. I think I said that right. There's so much here. There's so much in what I just gave you that we'll be unpacking it for the rest of this journey, this religious quest. But one thing to leave you on, at least for this portion, remember how this passage begins at the beginning of book seven, as I already read you once. Socrates says, now I said, compare the effect of education and the lack of education, compare that to these prisoners in a cave. So education, right? He's talking about education. He's talking about the relationship between education and justice. He's talking about the relationship between education and the Republic, the ability to have a functioning, a functioning society where everyone is fairly represented. And in order to do that, you can't have all these prisoners in the cave because the prisoners in the cave, they have their vote counts the same as yours. Right? So you've got to go down and educate them so that they make decisions based on their own self-interest and based on the self-interest of everybody in the Republic. That's what education is. But in order to do that, you have to go down into the cave and then down into the cave and talk to these fools and try and get them to understand the reality of their situation, that they're just living amidst shadows. They're just watching shadows on the wall, you know, shadows, shadows like the Matrix or... They're just trapped in this world. They're trapped in this matrix of shadows, things that aren't really real, but seem real to people. Things like Twitter or Facebook or all these things that are just artifacts that are techne, which are manufactured in order to keep people distracted, right? As long as you're sitting down in the cave and you, as long as you got something good to watch, as long as you have something that's entertaining and you got games that you can play with your other prisoners, then you don't even know that you're prisoner. That's the best way to keep people prisoners is by not letting them know that they're prisoners, right? And so Socrates says, but if we go down and we start educating people, what Paolo Freire calls conscientization, making people conscious of their ignorance and of their bondage, their oppression, only then can these people begin to turn that metanoia, that turning of their whole body. As I said, um, as Socrates says, education is not putting sight into the eyes. The eyes have sight already. But instead, turning the eyes and the entire body, turning the eyes and the body away from those shadows, away from those distractions, away from this unreality, this artificial, artificial, right? Artifacts are artificial. They're things that have been crafted. They're made. They're not... They're not natural, but they're artificial. They're made by humans. And so this world in which these prisoners are bound is an artificial one. It's created by, you know, shadows on the wall cast by artifacts such as fire and lanterns and all the artifacts that cast those images on the wall. And education then is going down and trying to get these people to turn away from 
um, what they've understood in the past, what's familiar, what's comfortable, what they're grown accustomed to, to turn away from that and then to lead them out of the cave. In fact, this word education, the word education comes from this word educare, and educare literally means to lead out. In fact, the word education comes from this text. This is where we get the word education, at least in this way, right? To educate is to lead people out, is to lead people out of the cave, to lead them away from those shadows and those artificial world, that darkness that that they think is a reality, that world of social media and um, 24-hour news bullshit and all that kind of stuff, to lead them out of that darkness and into the real world. Welcome to the real world. Into the real world where they can be where they can begin to see the light and to begin to enact justice in the world, not to it's not simply be satisfied with its shadow or these images of justice, which are cast by those oppressors who keep them bound in their cave. So the role of an educator is to lead people out of the cave, which is why the only way we can get out of the cave is together, right? The only way we can get out of the cave is together. To lead one another out of the cave is to move out of the cave together. 